Good afternoon. My name is Doug Cox, and on behalf of the DC Lawyers Chapter, welcome to our July luncheon. It's a tradition in this chapter that in July we sponsor a roundup of the recently completed Supreme Court term. For the last dozen years or so, the Society's great friend, Ted Olson, has given the roundup, and indeed, Ted's role has itself become part of the tradition. Unfortunately, this year, Ted's schedule required that he break his string of appearances. He asked me to express his deep regret that he cannot be with us today. Now, we all know that Ted is a very tough act to follow. Where could the society find someone with the stature, the sheer nerve, and the thirst for risk-taking to assume the mantle of an art form long ago perfected by Ted? Al Gore volunteered. <laughs> Gene and Leonard decided that a crazed sex poodle wasn't the kind of <laughs> profile we were looking for. But we are very lucky and honored that Greg Gar has been willing to suit up and be with us today. Greg is a former Solicitor General of the United States, and he'll be sharing with us his perspective of the recent Supreme Court term. Of course, the roundup is not the only prominent and influential Washington institution that is having to grapple with changing personnel this year. The Supreme Court may not be able to attract this crowd for lunch on a Friday in July, but it too is having the same kind of personnel problems. Justice Stevens has resigned, and President Obama, as we all know, has nominated his Solicitor General, Elena Kagan, as Justice Stevens' successor. We salute, salute Justice Stevens for his service, and we wish him well in retirement. As those of you who come to these lunches year in and year out know, we always like to have a little fun with percentages at the lunch, and the Kagan nomination gives us the opportunity for a snappy set of comparisons. Ted Olson, when he was Solicitor General, famously won eight out of eight cases his first year, so 100%. Greg, his year as Solicitor General, won four out of four. Again, 100%. So it seems like, you know, the court cuts them a couple slack, and 100% uh, win rate is the standard for your first year as SG. <laughs> so how does Solicitor General Kagan do? She argued six cases, one of which was dismissed as improvidently granted, so that leaves five. Of those five, she won three, lost two. 60% win rate. Fairly dramatic falling off. A noted lag from her predecessors. Some might even describe the fall from 100% to 60% as shocking. <laughs> but somehow, I doubt that this comparison weighs very heavily on the Solicitor General. 60%, 80%, the robes will fit just as well. In securing the nomination, she got the most important vote of all. But going behind the one loss analysis, how did the current justices vote in the SG's cases? Interestingly, the Chief Justice voted with her in all of her wins and against her in all of her losses. The justices most likely to agree with her were Justice Stevens, Breyer, and Sotomayor in a three-way tie, and the most likely to disagree were the other six in a six-way tie. <laughs> there were just no outliers. <laughs> now, the Kagan confirmation hearings did not rivet the nation's attention. And the art of being the nominee is to avoid saying anything interesting. But one notable phrase did crop up in the SG's testimony. She was asked whether she accepted President Obama's analogy that judging cases was like running a marathon and the law takes you 25 miles but the last mile is determined by what is in the judge's heart. She rejected that analogy, and she described her approach to judging as, quote, law all the way down. That's a curious phrase, law all the way down. It doesn't fit well as a response to the marathon analogy. She could have said, for example, the law gets you across the finish line. But instead, she used law all the way down several times. And if you search for the phrase on the internet, the only relevant hits are her testimony, her testimony and commentary on it. So law all the way down appears to be a phrase coined by the SG. 
It seems to me that she's echoing a famous anecdote recounted by Justice Scalia in Rapanos versus United States. There, Justice Scalia says, quote, an Eastern guru affirms that the earth is supported on the back of a tiger. When asked what supports the tiger, he says it stands upon an elephant. And when asked what supports the elephant, he says it is a giant turtle. When asked what supports the giant turtle, he replies, after that, it is turtles all the way down. <laughs> so given this, it's hard to know what we should make of the SG's use of the phrase law all the way down. Was she perhaps signaling that she is an interpretive ally of Justice Scalia? <laughs> or was she daydreaming about how much she likes turtles? Was she expressing her, her hostility to the Declaration of Independence by suggesting that justice is not deeply grounded on the laws of nature and of nature's God, but on nothing at all? Or was she so bored with the questioning that she figured a slightly odd, perhaps mystical answer might just shut the senators up? <laughs> we can only speculate, but I think this is one more instance in which Occam's razor suggests the answer. Now, our guest today was unanimously confirmed as the 44th Solicitor General of the United States. Earlier, Greg had been an assistant to the Solicitor General, the Principal Deputy Solicitor General, and Acting Solicitor General. He's the only person in history to have held all of those positions within the office of the Solicitor General. The SG always gets to argue interesting high-profile cases, and when Greg was SG, he was no exception. Among the cases he argued was the extremely important case of Ashcroft versus Iqbal, in which the court continued to emphasize that Rule 8 imposes meaningful pleading standards. Now earlier, when, uh, when uh, Greg was not yet SG, he'd had a chance to argue other cases that were equally important involving the war on terror and global warming. As SG, Greg also got the, uh, the honor of arguing the FCC's fleeting expletive case. And in the course of argument, I think it's appropriate, given that Justice Stevens is retiring, that we focus on Justice Stevens' commentary. Greg managed to elicit from Justice Stevens two notable observations. First, Justice Stevens said, quote, sometimes you can't help but laugh at swear words. And second, sometimes vulgarity can be, quote, really hilarious, very, very funny. So the justice, polite as always, somehow seemed to be channeling a sunnier, chirpier version of Rahm Emanuel while sitting on the case. <laughs> Nonetheless, Justice Stevens evidently did not find Greg's argument sufficiently amusing, even though Greg, of course, went on to win. The justice voted against him. Greg resigned his position as SG on January 20th, 2009. He is now a partner in Latham and Watkins and global chair of the firm's Supreme Court and Appellate Practice Group. In November 2009, he was named to Washingtonian Magazine's list of top Supreme Court lawyers. In 2006, he was named the American Lawyers Fab 50 list of top litigators under the age of 45, individuals who are expected to be, quote, leading the field for years to come. Greg graduated from Dartmouth and received his JD from George Washington. He clerked for Judge Sirica on the Third Circuit and for Chief Justice Rehnquist. Given his one loss record as SG, he's obviously overqualified for the Supreme Court, and we're delighted that he's here with us today. Greg. Uh, thank you, Doug, and thank all of you for being here today. I want to apologize at the outset to all of you who are sitting there thinking, Wait a second, I thought Ted was going to speak today. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I've been to this event before, and I know what a legendary job Ted does in hosting this event, and I, I know what a difficult act to follow it is. Uh, and when uh, Doug called me to ask me if I'd be willing to do this, um, the first thing I did, of course, was immediately say I would be thrilled to do it and accept. And the second thing that I did was sit to myself and think, oh my god, what did I do? <laughs> Um, you know, as, as many of you may have heard, I uh, recently testified in support of uh, Elena Kagan's uh, nomination for the Supreme Court and also recently argued uh, the Christian Legal Society case in the Supreme Court on behalf of the law school. And so here I am today. I'm, I'll leave it to you to see if that's a, there's any coincidence in that. But uh, I've been given the uh, uh, unenviable task of following Ted, but uh, I am happy to be here and I appreciate your time. 
I thought what I would do uh, in talking about the Supreme Court is to start off with uh, some multiple choice questions to test all of your knowledge about the court. And you can play along by raising your hand or sit there and think about what the right answer is. But the, the first question um, that I wanted to raise is how many cases were heard on oral argument this year at the court? Uh, A, 64, B, 77, C, 81, or D, 107? This is an easy one, it's 70, 77. I mean, that, that's about where the Supreme Court has been the last few years. It's remarkably down from a decade or 15 years ago where it was closer to uh, 150. Um, so if, if you can get the job as Supreme Court Justice, it's a, it's a good job to have. Um, second question is interesting. Uh, who authored the most 5-4 decisions this term? The Chief Justice, Justice Kennedy, Justice Alito, or Justice Sotomayor? Uh, it was Justice Alito, actually, by a fairly large margin. He had four 5-4 majority opinions that he wrote. The next closest was just the Chief Justice and Justice Kennedy, who both had two. Uh, and I think this is, this is interesting and significant in the sense that this may be the, the one area in which Justice Alito really is like Justice O'Connor. He's become uh, the Chief Justice's seeming the go-to person to write the 5-4 the cases, the most difficult cases where you need to hold the majority together, which I think uh, says a great deal about Justice Alito and then the Chief Justice's views on Justice Alito. Next question, uh, how many 5-4 decisions were there in argued cases in which Justice Stevens's, Stevens, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kennedy were in the majority. This is the 5-4 the, the block that the conservatives fear where, where Justice Kennedy goes and joins with the more liberal justices for five, five uh, justices. Uh, A, none, B, one, C, three, or D, five? The answer is one. Uh, only once this term in an argued case to just did that block form together. It was in the Christian Legal Society case that was handed down the last day of the term. And I, and I think that that's also significant, too. I think it says a lot about where the court was this year and the good term that Chief Justice Roberts had. And the last question is, and this is really extra credit because you'd really have to be a, a nerd to figure this one out, is uh, the defendant's video business in the United States versus Stevens was called Dog Day Videos, Dogs of Velvet and Steel, Crushed, or Pit Fights. Uh, it was dog, Dogs of Velvet and Steel, which, uh, you know, you probably come up with some good t-shirts or something like that, even if he can't sell his videos. Um, let, let me talk a, a little bit about broader themes from this year at the court, and then I'll talk about some of the cases in more detail. Um, I'm trying to... This is not working. Well, um, so one of, the, one of the broader themes is Chief Justice Roberts and, and what this court says about, what, what this term says about Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts significantly, I think, was in the majority more frequently uh, at, than any other justice. Uh, he was in the majority 91% of the time. Um, in prior years, we've seen Justice Kennedy in this role. Uh, Justice Kennedy was, was also in the majority very frequently. This year, Chief Justice Roberts was in the majority that uh, most frequent amount of time. Uh, he cast only seven dissenting votes. Uh, by comparison, Justice Stevens cast 22 dissenting votes. And so I think if you're um, a Chief Justice, you want to be in the majority. You don't want to be the Chief Justice known as the great dissenter. And so in that respect, I think that this was a very significant term for the Chief Justice in the Roberts Court. Uh, the, the member of the court who disagreed most frequently with Chief Justice Roberts was Justice Stevens, and he's leaving. So once one might think that uh, we would see more of that in years to come. The second, I think, broad uh, theme that, that comes from this court's term is that the, this is a confident court, no doubt about that. They're not afraid to get into um, areas of law that are contentious and very high profile. Um, but also a, a minimalist court uh, in, in some respects in the most significant decisions that it reached with the exception, I think, of Citizens United. 
Um, it, it, it wrote about the law in broad, confident terms, but yet I think ultimately at the end of the day acted in a very um, practical, uh, minimalist manner. Uh, for example, in the, in the free enterprise case, we'll talk about a little bit later, that the court uh, invalidated the removal provision of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the accounting board that the Congress had created in that case, um, but then went on to say that it was only invalidating the removal provision. It was leaving the board and the act intact. And I think we saw this in other cases like the honest services cases and even the, the gun case where the court uh, reaffirmed uh, its holding in Heller a few years back that the Second Amendment in corporate, uh, provides individual right to, to possess a firearm in the home for self-defense, but um, went no further than that in defining the contours of the right, but held that the right, uh, of course, was incorporated against the states as well. Um, so I think that that says a lot about the court as well. Uh, one other thing that we see is, is broader consensus on the court, and I think that this, too, says a lot about um, what the Chief Justice has been doing at the court. I think when he came on the court, he, took, he spoke about trying to foster greater unanimity to um, minimize the many differing opinions in cases, and, and, and some people said that that was just something that could not be achieved. Uh, well, in, in this term, uh, we had the fewest number of 5-4 cases that we've seen in many years. We had only 18 percent of the cases were decided by a 5-4 margin. Last year, 30 percent of the cases were decided by a 5-4 margin. Uh, Seventy-five percent of the cases were decided by a 7-2 margin, or a greater margin, 8-1 or 9-0. And I think that's 75 um, percent, that's a, that's a fairly high number. So I think that that does suggest um, that, that those efforts to foster consensus may be paying off, and it, and it certainly, I think, is, has made the court a less divisive place this year. And then the last thing I would say more broadly about the court is, although I think this is fair to say this is a conservative court, it's a confident court, uh, I'd also say that it's not your Rehnquist court. Uh, this court is emerging to be uh, different in the than the Rehnquist court in, in uh, various ways and potentially significant ways. Um, one way, um, this year at least, was, was good for capital defendants and habeas defendants. Uh, the, the Roberts Court this year uh, issued a number of decisions, uh, both in uh, per curiam summary reversals and uh, in published decisions like the Holland case dealing with tolling for the statute of limitations for federal habeas claims and the Magwood case dealing with uh, the rules for successive and successive petitions, um, handed down decisions with interesting lineups in favor of uh, inmates and habeas petitioners, which is something that um, is a little bit out of line with where the court was uh, five, ten years ago under Chief Justice Rehnquist. Uh, I think that another interesting point of comparison is the Comstock case, where uh, this court, by a 7-2 majority, um, wrote uh, very broadly about uh, Congress's uh, necessary and proper authority. Uh, and that case involved a challenge to the federal government's um, assertion of authority to um, uh, retain uh, individuals who've been sec sexually, who've been committed for sexual offenses once their sentences had expired to keep them under civil commitment. And the court held that that authority was within uh, Congress's necessary and proper authority and spoke in very broad terms. Uh, Justice Breyer wrote for the court, uh, the Chief Justice uh, joined the decision. In that case, uh, Justices Scalia and Thomas dissented very vigor vigorously, saying that the court's view of congressional par power was far too broad. And I think that that decision in point of comparison with cases like Lopez uh, and, and the like suggests that this court is, um, views congressional power uh, more broadly in that area, at least. Let me talk uh, a little bit about some of the major cases before the court this year. And I see that we're... Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, first case is the Citizens United case. I mean, since Ted can't be here, we can at least talk about what a great lawyer Ted is and his uh, win in this case where he succeeded in convincing the court by a 5-4 majority to overrule a statute that he had argued was constitutional about five years back as Solicitor General, um, <laughs> which is quite a remarkable feat. Um, I think all of you know about this case and involved a challenge to the electioneering communications provision of the McCain-Feingold McCain Campaign Finance Reform Act, a provision that um, said that corporations who want to run issue ads 
about candidates um, around the time of election cannot do so except through a PAC. Uh, and as all of you know, if any of you watched the State of the Union, the Supreme Court held that um, this provision was unconstitutional. Uh, and in doing so, overruled uh, two prior cases, uh, the McCain-Feingold decision, the McConnell case that Ted argued, and uh, the Austin case, which several years back was the first decision in which the court had held, upheld a state law imposing uh, a similar restriction on corporate expenditures. Obviously, a lot, have been, a lot has been written about this decision, subject to great criticism. Um, I, I think, you know, I would just offer sort of th three potential ways to think about this a little bit differently. Um, one way is to think of it not so much in what this says about Chief Justice Roberts or the Roberts Court, but to think about this in terms of what it says about Justice Kennedy. Uh, Justice Kennedy was in the dissent in the McConnell case a few years back. He was in the dissent in the Austin case a few years back, and he, and he uh, dissented very strongly and very vigorously, and, uh, and obviously has a, a strong view in the First Amendment. And I think, as, as we've seen in prior cases, for example, like the partial birth abortion case, um, when the votes come along, and with the change of Justice Alito and Justice O'Connor, they were there, I and mean, Justice Kennedy is very comfortable and, and one would think enjoys seeing his dissenting views become the law. So I think this case uh, may be a situation in which uh, Justice Kennedy's impact in the decision was just as important as anyone else's. Um, another way to think about it is that the court just generally doesn't like First Amendment theories that lead to the banning of books. And this is something that came up during the oral argument in the case, and it was very clear during the oral argument that the government's theory in this case was so broad that it could lead to the banning of the books and movies and all that sort of stuff, and the uh, Supreme Court generally doesn't like that. Um, the last thing I would say about it is the Chief Justice's concurring in an opinion in the case I think is very interesting. Uh, he spoke about uh, stare decisis, about the role of the court. He's been very outspoken in prior cases in saying if it's not necessary to decide a constitu constitutional issue, then it's necessary not to decide it. Well, in this case, he was confronted with that language by the dissenters, and he came back and he said um, that there is a difference between judicial restraint and judicial abdication. And in his view, in this case, not to decide these constitutional issues would be an act of judicial abdication. So I think that that says something interesting about his constitutional jurisprudence. Um, it did produce what I think will likely be the lasting image of this term, which is the President of the United States speaking to the justices, perhaps down to the justices at the State of the Union about this decision. Um, and, and I think when we look back, it may well be that moment that one thinks of. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see that just the other day, I think that the Washington Post reported that what we're seeing under this act is not uh, great corporate spending in elections, but great uh, union spending in elections. So I think a lot remains to be seen on the impact of this decision. Uh, the next case I want to talk about is the Salazar case, and this is a case out of the Ninth Circuit, and if you could see the slide over there, um, the case dealt with a um, challenge to the constitutionality of a cross placed uh, in the Mojave Desert uh, in order to commemorate uh, fallen soldiers in World War II, and the picture on the left, you can see it as a picture of a cross in the desert. The picture on the right, if you can see it, is a picture of a cross in the Ninth Circuit. It's uh, covered with uh, boards. And, and what happened in this case is um, the Ninth Circuit and the district courts held that uh, it violated the Establishment Clause to place this cross on federal land. And Congress decided that it would try to remedy that Establishment Clause violation by passing a land transfer statute. They would transfer the land on which the cross sat uh, to the hands of a private party, the veterans of foreign wars, and therefore cure the, the Establishment Clause problem. And the, the district court in the Ninth Circuit didn't so much like that. They, they held that Congress couldn't contravene the terms of their injunction, which required the, that the cross be removed, and the case found its way to the Supreme Court. Uh, and the Supreme Court reversed the Ninth Circuit decision and held that the Ninth Circuit and the district court had erred uh, in concluding uh, reflexively that the, the purpose of the land transfer statute was illicit uh, and sent the case back to uh, for further reconsideration uh, to, to take another look at the constitutionality of the land transfer statute and to see if it 
um, contravene the terms of the injunction. It was one of these cases where I think it was a very narrow decision. Uh, Justice Alito wrote separately, he argued that um, there was no need to send it back, that the land transfer statute was constitutional. Uh, Chief Justice, or Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas argued that there was no standing for the people to sue in this case. The next case uh, I wanted to talk about was the honest services cases, uh, or I'm sorry, the uh, juvenile sentencing cases. Um, these cases, as you know, dealt with the challenge to the constitutionality of uh, state laws that uh, provided for uh, life, life, life in prison without parole for juveniles who committed a very, various sentences. The juvenile in this case was convicted of robbery. He, uh, he was involved in very serious robbery. He then got out of jail and committed several other robbery, robberies and the judge thought it would be appropriate to sentence him to life without parole. Um, the Supreme Court uh, granted cert in the case, and it, as all of you know, in Ropers versus Simmons, a few years back, the court held that it would be unconstitutional to um, subject juveniles to the death sentence. And in this case, the court, following very much the reasoning uh, in the prior case, held that it was unconstitutional to subject juveniles to uh, life imprisonment without parole. Justice Kennedy wrote the decision, engaging in the sort of analysis that keeps Justice Scalia up at night, referring to the consensus uh, in the other states and other laws and referring to the consensus around the world. Uh, Justice, I think Je Chief Justice Roberts actually concurred in the result in this case in an interesting decision. Um, his view was that the court should not hold that it was unconstitutional in every case to impose uh, life in prison without parole, but should look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and Justices Alito, Thomas, and Scalia dissented. Uh, and, and said that this was a sort of proportionality analysis that the court had never engaged in in the non-capital context and chided the majority and the chief for going along with this and suggested this is going to lead to a lot more litigation about the proportionality of non-capital sentences. Uh, next case is the, is a taking, I'm sorry, the, the skilling case, the honest services case, um, which dealt with, there are actually three cases, including uh, the Skilling's prosecution itself, where the court, uh, in significant series of decisions, held that the honest services statute um, could only be interpreted to apply to bribery and kickbacks, and it rejected uh, as unconstitutionally vague, broader interpretations of the statute. Uh, justices, uh, again, a very, a fairly narrow decision. Uh, Justice Scalia and Thomas would have gone further in uh, striking down the statute across the board is unconstitutionally vague, um, but the majority joined by the Chief Justice and um, a number of uh, other justices uh, found that it was appropriate to narrowly construe the statute. I think this is, is gonna have a major impact on government prosecutions. It's already having an impact on the prosecution of the former governor of Illinois. Uh, this is a statute that's been used by prosecutors for many years in, in a, wide, a wide variety of situations. And this is a, is a case that's interesting where you had Justice Scalia, I think, really sort of leading the charge and getting the court interested in this statute again and initiating it with a dissent from the denial of certiorari and ultimately culminating uh, in this case, which may be the most defendant-friendly criminal law decision of the term. Uh, next case is the Stop the Beach case, which is a, a takings case, and another example of a court um, getting close to a broad constitutional ruling but not reaching it. So in this case, um, it was brought by uh, landowners who objected to a law that allowed the state of Florida to come in and um, uh, put sand on beaches to protect against erosion. They argued that it interfered with their property rights uh, to these areas of the beaches to access the beach and the like. Uh, and in some respects, the question in this case was really whether the United States Supreme Court could ever agree with the Florida Supreme Court. Uh, and it turns out that the answer is yes, uh, at least sort of. Um, so the, the question in the case that was teed up was whether or not there could be such a thing as a judicial taking, where the court's construction of its own law could be so contrary to prior law in a property rights case um, that it could amount to a judicial taking in violation of the Fifth Amendment. Uh, and four justice, justices in the court, led by Justice Scalia, uh, said that yes, there could be a judicial taking, but ultimately concluded that uh, there was not a judicial taking in this case, that the Florida Supreme Court had not, so, had not um, 
uh, violated clearly established Florida property rights, rights law, so there was no taking. Uh, Justice Kennedy was the fifth vote who would not go along with that analysis. Uh, he suggested that perhaps the proper way to go for this sort of uh, problem would be through the due process clause, not the takings clause. And the remaining justices went even further in saying that the court shouldn't really get into this uh, business of judicial takings at all at this point. Um, the humanitarian law project case um, was the most significant terrorism case that the court decided this term. And in, in the decision, the court upheld the constitutionality of the material support statute, which has been used by the government in a number of cases to go after individuals who are providing support to terrorist organizations. Uh, the individuals in this case wish to provide money and training to two terrorist organizations, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ilam and the Kurdistan Workers Party, uh, and argued that the, the, this law violated the First Amendment rights to provide that kind of support. Um, the court, in a 6-3 decision written by Justice Roberts, upheld the constitutionality of that law, um, hold, explaining that uh, there was a compelling interest, surely, in, in having the government not, uh, having individuals not support organizations engaged in ter terrorism, and, and deferring to Congress's judgment that this was an appropriate way to, to further that interest. I think maybe one of the most interesting things about this decision is the fact that Justice Stevens joined the majority in this case to uphold the stat constitutionality of the statute. He didn't write separately to explain whether he was just trying to, to uh, give something back after his decisions in Rasul and Hamdan on his way out, um, but it was interesting that the Chief Justice got him to go along in his decision in that case. There was another terrorism case pending before the court the term, uh, this term, the Kiemba case, which involved the question of whether district courts can order the transfer of Gitmo detainees back into, into the United States. Uh, and that case was teed up for oral argument this spring, uh, but the court sent it back to the uh, D.C. Circuit for further consideration in light of uh, intervening factual developments of the government's effort, effort to repatriate the uh, individuals at, at issue in the case. And I think what, what's interesting about this case is not only that the Supreme Court did not decide it this term, um, but by virtue of having gone back uh, and by virtue of uh, the Solicitor General, Lenny Kagan, perhaps being the next justice on the court, uh, it may be difficult and impossible for the Supreme Court to take this case again because it went back to the D.C. Circuit. The D.C. Circuit, in an opinion by Judge Randolph, promptly said, well, these intervening developments don't make any difference at all. Uh, and now, if, if the plaintiffs wish to take it up to the Supreme Court, they presumably would left with, be left with a uh, eight-justice uh, court rather than a nine-justice court, which at most could, could produce a 4-4 decision affirming uh, the D.C. Circuit by an equally divided vote. One of the most important separation of powers decision was the free enterprise case involving the challenge to the um, public company accounting oversight board. Uh, and this was in some ways sort of an obscure constitutional question, but I think in other ways it says a lot about the Roberts Court view of separation of powers and the um, responsibilities of the executive. So in this case, you, the board uh, was protected, members of the board were protected from, for, from two layers of four cause removal provisions. One, the members of the board could be removed only for cause by the uh, commissioners of the SEC. Uh, and two, the president could only remove the commissioners of the SEC for cause. Uh, and the Supreme Court held that the existence of those dual for cause removal uh, restrictions um, violated the constitutional separations of power by unduly infringing on the president's ability to carry out the laws. And I think it, he, the Chief Justice didn't say it in his opinion, but he said it at oral argument in announcing his decision that it violated the, the fundamental maxim of the buck stops here, that ultimately the president has to be accountable and be able to exercise accountability over inferior executive officers. A um, couple interesting things about the decision in this case is the government, ha the, the Chief Justice had a little bit fun with the government's position in the case uh, noting that it was sort of odd that the government representing, um, defending the constitutionality of the statute, but of course appearing as an officer uh, or advocate on behalf of the president. 
And the Chief Justice said, perhaps an individual president might find advantages in not in tying his own hands, but the separation of powers doesn't depend on the views of individual presidents. And, and you know, interesting language in the court's decision about, uh, about the president, uh, the particular president and the way the government decided to handle this case. Um, the, the Chief Justice also got into a debate with Justice Breyer about the role of these inferior officers in our government and the need for these sorts of four-cause removal provisions. Justice Breyer was very upset that the court was invalidating these provisions and thought it would have a dramatic effect on our government. And the Chief Justice's response to that for the court uh, was, I think, a classic sort of Robertsian response that one can have a government that functions without being ruled by functionaries and a government that benefits from expertise without being ruled by experts. Justice Breyer, I don't think, agreed with that. Um, the remedy in this case, again, was very narrow, getting back to this notion that the court uh, speaks in broad constitutional terms back, acts in a, in a more minimal way. The court invalidated only the, the four-cause removal provision and let the board and the act intact. Uh, maybe the, next to Citizens United, the most important case of the term is, of course, the McDonald case, but in some respects that was the worst kept secret of the term and that everyone, I think, anticipated that given what the court said in Heller about the existence of an individual right to uh, possess guns for self-defense in the home, uh, the court would surely say that that right would be incorporated against the states. It would be an odd thing if it only applied within the District of Columbia. It was a 5-4 decision. It was a very uh, divisive case. Um, uh, the conservatives, more conservative justices, um, divided on how the law should be incorporated, the Second Amendment should be incorporated against the states. Uh, four justices, led by Justice Alito, who wrote for the, for the plurality, held that it should be incorporated under the Due Process Clause as a fundamental right. And Justice Thomas, proving again that he's perhaps the boldest justice on the court, wrote that it should be incorporated through the Privileges and Immunities Clause, uh, something that uh, the other justices in the majority were not willing to swallow. And I think it was an oral argument that Justice Scalia even remarked to the attorney who was making that argument that you know this might be a good argument for the academy, but uh, uh, the court was uncomfortable um, going that far in its own decision. Uh, Justice Alito's decision in the case, I think, is narrow. Uh, it, it, the court is the decision very significant in that it extends the Second Amendment, makes clear that it does apply to the states. But it is very narrow in how it characterizes the Second Amendment right as specifically framed in terms of how it was characterized in Heller and the court again um, acting in a fairly, I think, minimalist way, refused to provide guidance on the contours of the Second Amendment right and left for another day uh, the many difficult questions about uh, the application of that right to particular uh, gun, gun regulations across the country. Uh, the Christian Legal Society case was the one case that I mentioned earlier in which the, um, the five justice, more conservative majority, uh, did not hold together. And the question in that case was whether a law school, public law school, uh, could have a rule for its ex extracurricular groups that received uh, funding from the school and used the school's facilities, that uh, all groups, in order to become a registered school-funded uh, extracurricular group, uh, had to admit all comers. And this case was brought by the Christian Legal Society, who argued that forcing it to admit all comers, including students who could not sign a statement of faith because uh, they, they may have disagreed with uh, the group's views on gay rights and homosexuality and the like, um, that forcing the group to admit those students would interfere with its free speech rights and its free freedom, free exercise rights. And a five justice majority led by Justice Ginsburg and joined by Justice Kennedy uh, held that that uh, neutral, viewpoint neutral, as the majority found it to be, uh, all comers policy did not violate their speech rights and did not violate their uh, free exercise rights. Uh, the dissenters did not like that very much. It was a, a very strongly worded dissent. Uh, at one point, the dissent referred to the majority's decision as a judicial dagger in the heart of expression uh, of religious groups. And uh, but it was a. I think the, the fact that it was a lone example where this majority came together um, and that the Roberts Court and more conservative justices were so successful in other cases uh, is, is significant. 
Um, the last case, individual case I want to talk about was the Bilski case, and there's really nothing to say about this case because the court's decision is, is so minimal again, um, except to note that this was really, I think, one of the most anticipated business cases in recent years dealing with the question of the patentability of, of business methods. In this case, a uh, individual tried to get a patent for the process of hedging risks and was de the, the patent office held that that was not patentable. Federal Circuit held that that was not patentable. And not surprisingly, the Supreme Court held that that was not patentable. Um, what was, I think, most surprising about the decision was how narrowly the court ruled. Uh, Justice Kennedy wrote for uh, five justices to say that, uh, well, we're not going to agree with the Federal Circuit's test, the machine, you had to have a mas machine or transformation in order to be patentable uh, as, a, as a business method. Um, uh, but we're not going to go further than that in, in delineating what, what are the requirements for getting a patent for a, a business method. Uh, Justice Stevens uh, wrote the dissent, or wrote a concurring opinion, basically disagreeing very strongly with the majority's decision in this case, and in his view, that the court should just say that these uh, business met methods weren't patentable at all. Just a few thoughts. It's, it's impossible to look back on this term and not think about the departure of Justice Stevens and the arrival of Justice Sotomayor uh, to deal with the former first. I and mean, I think um, what's mo most noteworthy, perhaps, about Justice Sotomayor's term is how um, unsurprising it was in the sense that uh, she tended to, vo to vote uh, in almost all the cases with the more liberal justices, um, there, even in, in, in the more important, some of the more important criminal procedure cases, including the Miranda cases where she wrote uh, one of the lead dissents and, and the Skilling case, she dissented on a question of whether the pretrial publicity interfered with Mr. Skilling's um, due process rights to, rights to a fair trial. Um, she voted with the, in the dissent in those cases and with the liberal justice most of the time. And there really wasn't um, much interesting about her uh, votes this term. And it, it may be because it's her first term in the court. Um, it, it may be that she's, she's just going to be in that direction, but we'll have to see in further terms. Um, Justice Stevens, of course, uh, his departure is, I think, uh, hugely significant for the court uh, in a number of different ways. As I mentioned earlier, he's a justice who, who has disagreed most frequently with the Roberts majority, and although one would suspect that his uh, replacement will agree with Justice Stevens in, in many cases, um, it, it remains to be seen whether she uh, will disagree with the majority as many times as, as Justice Stevens. Uh, Justice Stevens also obviously has undertaken an extremely important role with the more li liberal wing in the court, particularly in the last decade or so as a sort of Obi-Wan Kenobi type leader of that wing, pulling together majorities, bringing in Justice Kennedy in, in cases, and um, it's, it's by no means apparent you know, who, who that member of the court is going to be to step up and fill that role or whether that member uh, will, will, will be there. Uh, and, and I think uh, it's probably unfair um, to, to assume or not right to assume that Justice Kagan, if she's confirmed, will be able to assume that role, but uh, uh, it will be something that I think will be interesting to watch in the coming years. And then, uh, you know, just in conclusion, I will return to what I began with, which is to say that I think this was a uh, very good year for the Roberts Court. I think that this year solidified uh, that there is a Roberts Court. Uh, if you're a, a Chief Justice, uh, I think it, you want them to be talking about the court as, as your court and not someone else's court. I mean, we tend to be talking about the Roberts Court and not the Kennedy Court or someone else's court. So I think that that is um, certainly very indicative of where the court is this year. I think in many ways, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the image that one might get, have gotten earlier in the term of the justices being spoken to at the State of the Union, which maybe was a, a lower point for the court um, has been replaced by the image uh, that one gets at the very end of the term of a, of a confident court, a court in which um, uh, the more conservative justices were in the majority most of the time, and a court in which the Chief Justice was in the majority um, almost all the time. And so I will stop there and uh, thank you all uh, for being here today.
Greg, thank you for coming and joining us today. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, we do have lots of traditions in this chapter, and one of the traditions is that uh, we'd like to give our guests as a uh, memento of the event, a leather-bound copy of the Federalist Papers. I'm sure that you've uh, consulted this many a time, but as you continue forward and uh, get to re-argue that Christian case, maybe this will come in handy. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you.